Uh, okay, so with that, let's start. Okay, so Rhythm's joining. Thanks, Red, and then other guys uh, as well. If you want, I'll, I'll invite you. It would be actually easier to me if we uh, kind of share the, the speaking thing, but you can type in the chat as well. The chat is on, on the right side. Okay, so here's how it's going to go. So uh, like the last time I prepared uh, something, yeah, and I'll, I'll recording the thing also. I hope the recording will work. So like the last time I prepared uh, a bit of uh, presentation with a lot of demos. Uh, hopefully, it'll take no more than half an hour. And then we'll do just free form conversation and discussion. And if any one of you wants to share some information about some tool or something basically you want to share that's relevant, then feel free to jump in at any time. Also, feel free to interrupt me, uh, type questions in chat. And, uh, and do things like that. Okay, so now I'm just going to share my screen and I'll start with my presentation. So I'll, I'll do a lot of uh, a lot of little demos that I kind of prepared in this half an hour. Okay, so let me share the screen. Yeah, Rhythm, and if you see something's off, then let me know, please. Okay, so I'll do like full screen. Yeah, so now you should be able to see my screen, uh, like you can click on it and you can see full screen. And that's basically... Uh, okay. Sorry about that. I think, yeah, I need to disconnect the other screen. Okay, let, let's try one more time. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing my screen. So today uh, there was uh, basically a request uh, on the last meetup we had that, uh, okay, so we have uh, cloud, we have cloud tools and uh, they're expensive to use. So what basically the question is what uh, we can do locally to uh, to work with those tools. So uh, I thought it would be nice to have this meetup around DevOps and DevTools, mostly about DevOps tools, but a little bit about Dev. So that's a slide the same as last time about myself. Uh, and yeah, this is the disclaimer slide that I always put. Basically it says that uh, a lot of things that I'm saying may be opinionated and uh, which is normal. And I, I kind of do it because I have opinions and also I do it on purpose, but you don't need to believe uh, everything you hear. You should verify information and stuff like that. Although I try to be correct. Uh, so this is kind of important. So this is basically objectives of today's sessions and generally of the tooling in general. So the important part is what developers want. They want quick and easy tooling to create spawn the environments. So the key word is easy. So they want everything to be easy and just work. And now for DevOps and operations specialists, what we want is uh, we want to be able to set up those tools. And also we want to learn the nitty gritty details. And uh, we want to learn things, how they behave the hard way. And this is a little bit of contradiction here between what developers want and between what we as DevOps professionals want. So they want easy. We want like go in depth and details and uh, like mentally, it's very important to separate this and know like at which point basically our uh, experiments with tooling stops and uh, where the part starts when we upload this uh, tools to developers. So I'll try to get back to this subject a little later. Uh, so the other thing that came up is uh, like the platform, which may be used for home labs and home tooling. 
So mainly this is question about uh, AMD64 versus ARM platforms. So you may know that some of the latest MacBooks, for example, they have uh, ARM CPUs. Also, there is like ARM support on the cloud. Um, I would, uh, at this point in time, I would say that uh, AMD64 is still a better option in many cases, because uh, if you're going to use ARM platform, you'll have issues around compatibility of some Docker containers, Docker images, stuff like that. So you'll have issues which normally you don't need to deal with. Uh, again, it may be interesting to experiment, but as a main uh, tool to work, I would uh, recommend uh, AMD Intel-based CPUs uh, at this point of time. Uh, the o operating system question, I'd say any OS will do. Uh, I usually use Windows and Linux, so Windows because I have some software which I like, uh, but it, it's only my personal preference. Uh, generally, a lot of container and related tooling, they work on any operating system. Windows works these days as well because we have WSL, uh, WSL2, and it supports a lot of those things. Uh, finally, what I wanted to mention, it's a good idea to invest in a large single machine for home labs with uh, ample size memory, so 32 gigabytes or 64 or more if possible. Uh, like, I don't know, buy a laptop with extendable memory and uh, let's say it has it comes with 16 on board, just buy additional memory and have more. And this way you can create like separate VMs or run a lot of Docker and other load where possible. Uh, so that's what I wanted to mention about platform. So now about tooling. So, and I'll, I'll start a little bit about this demos. So first tool I want to mention is kind of old, but it's very useful for, uh, I mean, it, it's kind of needed for DevOps. Uh, it's called Vagrant, and it can spin uh, arbitrary virtual machines uh, on top of uh, different uh, hypervisors. So in, in my case, I do it on VirtualBox, but they support like VMware and they support other stuff as well. And in Vagrant, uh, they have, so I provided this link, which you'll be able to access later if needed. Uh, this link contains basically a list uh, of a bunch of uh, VMs that are supported on Vagrant, and you can spin them on, on your machines. So uh, to be fair, I'll, I'll say right away, this, uh, this is not used frequently. It's used rarely. But you can use this tool to do, like, to try a lot of things hard way, and I'll describe how in a bit. And uh, I'll, I'll do just a very quick demo right, right here for Vagrant. Um, uh, hi, Paul. Uh, yeah. You're not sharing your screen. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen at all? Or right now? Yeah, no, at all. At all. Okay, let me, let me share it again. Was it there before or no? Uh, it was for some time, uh, but then it went away. Okay. So, do you see it now? Can you check? Yes. 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 yes I see. It. Okay. Did uh, Did you get the slides, or were were they missing? Uh, slides were missing earlier. Okay. So I'll just show you. Just I mean I'll, I'll scroll. I'll briefly scroll through the slides. So. This is uh, like the objective slide that I mentioned, and then uh, kind of the platform sl slide, which I just, just described. And so this is the Vagrant, and it has the, the link. Um, the link uh, that I mentioned where you can download the boxes. Uh, you still see the screen, right? Screen. Yes, I see it. OK, awesome. So I hope uh, others see it as well. OK, so now I'm going to show, yeah, so I prepared this thing uh, for this met meetup related to Vagrant. Do you see the, it's like the, the terminal? Do you see it here? Yes, uh, we see the terminal. OK, good. 
So basically, uh, the the way Vagrant works, so I obviously kind of pre-installed it on already because I prepared it a little bit. But so what you have here is you have Vagrant file. And essentially, this file just describes the virtual machine that you want to spin. And we can list it. It has a lot of configuration commented out, basically. And the important part, it says, this is the important part. It says, OK, I want uh, this image, which is so Debian Buster 64. Then I configured some special disk size. And then I have some VM network configuration. And you can actually see what it is. I had to do it this way because I, I needed I need to show one more thing on this box. Oh yeah, and you can configure like memory that you allocate and CPU cores that you allocate to VM. And for the memory part, as I mentioned, that's uh, yeah, no no GUI. Uh, what's important if you have you need to have like some substantial size size on your laptop so you can allocate all those things. So all I want to do here now, I just do vagrant up. And it takes maybe two minutes, maybe less. I already had this running, so it will be a little faster. If you if you do it for the first time, it would also like download the the image and, and that stuff. You see also it maps actually the SSH port 22 to 2222 on the host. So you can SSH via this this address. So just booting the VM here. We'll, we'll wait for a bit. And I, I actually realize a, little, a lot of people, a lot of you may know about this, uh, but I kind of want to cover, try to cover everything end to end. Yeah, it was it was a bit faster just before, but hopefully it'll get there. I'll tell. Um, so while it's booting, I'll tell you uh, what can be done on top of that. So basically, uh, one one cool thing that can be done, you can actually have several vagrant VMs uh, created at the same time. All you need to do for that is just create different directories like this and put different Vagrant file in each of them, which can be kind of very similar Vagrant file. And then uh, you can put them on the same network. Let's say you can do three machines. Oh, something's off with the live. I, I'm wondering if any of the Discord stuff is uh, actually messing with that. Uh, no, OK, it's booted. So you can create several of these VMs, and you can do stuff as, for example, trying to install Kubernetes hardware or things like that on the VM. So machine is booted, and once it's booted, what I can do, I can do Vagrant SSH. Uh, and this essentially brings, brings me inside of this machine. And then I can get like, I don't know, networking config. So uh, that's the IP address that I have for the machine, which actually changed. So I, I have to adjust it for my other demo. So basically, I can use this machine for, for, for anything I want. And that, that's sufficiently quick. And that's how I can create uh, VMs locally without without much trouble. And that's, that's not like a Docker uh, container. That's a full-sized VM. Uh, so the, again, again, the tool is relatively old. We don't use it that frequently these days, but for labs and for practice, that that's actually very useful for a lot of things. So that's uh, that's the first tool that I wanted to mention. And again, uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat, and maybe Rhythm can follow these questions and ask me. So next thing, uh, again, this is uh, considered all technology. But what you can do on this VM, you can, for example, run uh, Ansible on that. So configuration management tools are Ansible, Chef, Puppet, Solstack. Those are the major ones. And this is like what I call previous generation of uh, DevOps. 
previous, like before Docker, before containers, before Kubernetes. Uh, Ansible is the one uh, surviving technology, so that's the one that may be more recommended to learn out of the others. The others are like purely like legacy tools, uh, but they're kind of interesting. Also, what can be used is there is Terraform Vagrant provider. So if you're just learning Terraform, then you can actually spin Vagrant boxes with Terraform, which kind of familiarizes a little bit with the syntax and you don't have to incur any cloud costs there. So the next thing I wanted to show here is um, running Ansible on, on this Vagrant VM. So I'll go to my other terminal here. So on Windows, I have to do it from VSL and uh, I think I have to mo uh, modify Yeah, that was 109, I think, the IP. Yeah. So you remember I had this uh, virtual machine running right here. So now I created the Ansible playbook file here. Essentially what it does, it uh, installs the latest Nginx on it. So what I did also is um, I provisioned my SSH key. Uh, I mean, while I was preparing for the meetup, I provisioned my uh, local SSH key on that machine. So Ansible can actually use it. And hopefully let's see. Yeah, let's see if we can run this. So I'm just running Ansible playbook. Uh, the host, uh, the IP has changed, so I have to register a new host. And now, basically, you see, supposedly it have installed the Nginx. Let's let's verify if that happened. Uh, yeah, no. Okay, maybe, maybe I need actually to... Let's see if that actually works. Yeah, no, that doesn't see the Nginx. Okay, maybe maybe something off with uh, my Ansible script there, but basically uh, the important thing that I wanted to show that... Um, let me check if, if it works like this. Yeah, so for some reason it's not running, like we'll debug this later, but you see that engine, it's probably not enabled. So I may need to tweak the script or something, but you can see that Nginx is actually installed. And it's installed uh, via this uh, Ansible playbook. And uh, yeah, I'm actually, I mostly worked with Chef when this thing's, uh, the configuration manager was popular and we're not using Ansible that frequently now. Uh, but again, uh, this uh, lets you, so this exercise lets you use Vagrant VM to play with Ansible and things like, things like that. And basically, uh, the, my point here was to show the, the setup, so how you can set these things up. So that was Ansible. So let's see what's next. Uh, so next is... Uh, essentially Docker and Kubernetes. Uh, as I just described before, you can spin several Vagrant VMs and you can play with uh, setting up Kubernetes hard way on them. This is purely DevOps exercise. Developers certainly don't need it. And uh, you can use kubeADM, which is like not very hard way. And you can use full hardware, so you can Google for Kubernetes hardware and set up its end-to-end -end, uh, on Vagrant VMs, and that, that's a little bit of fun. This this can take you like a day or two. Uh, the next set of tooling is Docker Desktop and Docker Compose. Uh, I still use it quite frequently. So the problem with Docker Desktop is uh, due to the licensing change. 
you will see that a lot of enterprises are not using it anymore. Uh, there is a Rancher desktop, which is a full drop-in replacement if you use uh, Docker uh, D engine for containers. And also the Rancher desktop allows you to create arbitrary K3S servers. Again, the cool thing on Windows, it works with WSL2 and you can fully use it on Windows. And then there is this K3D project, which allows you, so if you have Docker running, you can create very quickly um, Kubernetes clusters in no time on, uh, on Docker. And uh, uh, I'm going to show very quickly also how this works. So, so you just can do K3D cluster, create my cluster, assuming K3D is installed. And this is pretty much all, all the time it takes to create uh, to create the cluster. So let's let's try what they say. Yeah. So cluster is running, and we can if I do Docker PS. So you can see there are like bunch, like there is K3S and a bunch of K3D images running. So I actually have my cluster and I can do. So those are the images just created. And there is also a way to expose it on, on the local port. So I had the command here. Let's see. Yeah. So if we add uh, this command, so this will essentially expose the uh, K3S ingress on this port. And with the same speed, you can do just K3S cluster delete my cluster. And you see it's very quick and easy. Uh, this can work for both DevOps and uh, developers as well. That may be uh, the fastest way to create uh, like local throwaway K3S clusters. Uh, so one other item I wanted to mention here in many containers uh, that in many uh, public images that you will find like in Postgres, they use uh, a separate da uh, data volume to store uh, data. So the images come with no data inside. So one technique we were using, I won't show it now, but essentially creating a, uh, your own database image with data inside it and then you can actually check in this uh, image so push this image to a storage with all the data inside it and this way you can share data between developers in the image itself uh, which in some cases if uh, if you work in some data environment is pretty uh, pretty useful i would say uh, if it's not very clear like ask me later about it i'll show so now one uh, cool thing that I wanted to describe is uh, cloud emulation. And essentially this answers the question that we had. Okay, so cloud is expensive. Let's say we want to test something on AWS and uh, we need to pay for uh, uh, cloud costs. And again, this may be expensive if you're just learning on yourself. So there is this very nice tool which is called local stack. And I'm running it here in the Docker container. I'll show you. So I have this local stack container. It's local stack, yeah. And you see, uh, so this is the results of my test. Last of them was uh, today, not so long ago. So basically what I can show here is uh, you can actually create Terraform scripts. So I have this script for K3S node, which essentially creates, uh, supposedly creates K3S node on, on uh, uh, AWS. So this is my subnet AWS instance resource. And this local stack provides command uh, TF local, and I can do TF local plan and now what's happening, it's pointing this Terraform script, not to the public AWS, not to the real AWS, 
but to my local stack container. And I can go ahead and actually apply this plan. So it works exactly as the normal Terraform. It's just pointing to this local stack uh, endpoints. And uh, it's not going, uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll say yes. It's not going to create a real, um, uh, how we call it, uh, real instance in this case, uh, but like a dummy instance, and it, it will create a record in the local stack of this instance. You can see, so we're just tailing the logs here, and you can see these are all the uh, API endpoints that this Terraform local is, is actually reaching with this Terraform script. And it's much faster than the real AWS because it doesn't create a real instance. Also, you see the public IP is actually empty because there is no real public IP created. There is also no real instance created. But this way, you can test your Terraform scripts against local instance. It's, uh, it has some compatibility issues, but I'd say, like in, in my experience, it may be 95% compatible. So it, it mostly works. And you can test a lot of things uh, on top of that, uh, like in, in, that, uh, in that local stack uh, environment without actually using the, the real AWS. And this helps a lot. Uh, with uh, provisioning those scripts, creating those scripts without actually incurring any cloud costs whatsoever. Um, and as I, I mentioned before, there is this Terraform Vagrant provider that you can use as well, uh, which you can use to also test Terraform local commands. And you could actually wire Ansible on top of that and maybe other configuration tools, provisioners. So Again, you can do a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of tests and experiments locally with only those tools. Um, I made uh, like one reference because this thing is kind of getting, so we're not using it frequently, but it's getting traction in some environments. Uh, so containers.dev, uh, you can research this tool as well. This uh, is what's called development containers. Uh, this is a rubber on Docker with some uh, JSON configuration that runs. Con so the idea is to create uh, similar environments for, for uh, all developers in containers. And this JSON rubber kind of tries to f further abstract Docker containers and Docker images. Uh, we don't use this frequently, but I know there are some modern tools around that, and maybe uh, there is something interesting about it. In my experience so far, I mostly was able to achieve those goals uh, with just plain containers, Docker, Venture, uh, Docker Compose, uh, Kubernetes, Helm, all the existing tooling. Uh, but maybe uh, this will be... So the, the, the key point is, is it much easier for developers to use or not? So maybe the answer is yes, we'll just need to, to observe and see if this gets a lot of tra more traction. So great, so that is what I wanted to show so far. And um, I actually was able to, oh, Sorry, so there are a bunch of people writing in the chat, and yeah, I'll approve, so we'll just go to, to the chat now. Uh, Hello. Yeah, hi, Tatal. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining. Thank you. Um, something I wanted to bring up, so we kind of go went over Docker, mostly here in Terraform, um, but uh, in, in the data engineering world, from, from my experience, um, a lot of it is, is Kubernetes. Um, uh, on the enterprise level. So I included in the chat a link for what's called Minikube yeah. uh, in the Meetup channel. Minikube is effectively a, a local uh, Kubernetes cluster that you can do all of the same things you're doing here with the Terraform on Docker that you can do with Minikube. So if you want to learn how to use Helm or you want to use uh, kind of try and create more distributed applications and not incur AWS credits or anything like that, it's a really good place to start. And all you need is a dual core CPU, which every computer that comes out nowadays has that. 
uh yeah th thank you very much uh just uh before uh yeah b before i comment uh uh Pankthi, very very quick uh question like i just saw you you were saying that the streams passed was it written was it the same issue you saw with the uh with the my presentation so basically pa oh sorry my power dropped to ah, okay uh, so so thanks to you if the issue is resolved for you could you just type in the chat that that all good or request to speak and i'll invite you as well uh so yeah that i'll thank you very much for bringing minikube yeah that, that's a great tool uh and i also want to bring up yeah. that um if you guys are actually really serious about getting into this uh i'll put a link in the chat once i find the link because ABWS makes it hell to find it, but there's a proof of concept program. You don't need a company. You don't need all of that. You just need an AWS account. You apply for the proof of concept program. It takes about a week. It's how long it took me about, and they'll give you $300 in credits. Yes, yes, for sure. That that that's a good point. So AWS gives you some credits. Plus, uh, I think they have they give you like a plan they have a year, yearly yeah, they plan. have a they have a yeah they have a free plan they also have um gcp has 300 dollars for free if you join gcp instead of aws just straight off the back you set up a gcp account yeah a google cloud platform it's it's 300 dollars aws you gotta apply it's a little bit more of a hassle but um i definitely suggest going with one of those two or with azure um, if you want to be a data engineer, because data engineering, they use a lot of Azure data programs, even if I, I've worked at companies where we're AWS top to bottom in the data engineering is Azure. <laughs> yeah. um, they've just really upgraded their, their data engineering stack recently, AWS, or uh, Azure has, so a lot of companies are switching to it. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you very much. So for AWS credits, yeah, that, that's a great point. And uh, you can have uh, yeah, uh, on Azure as well, I think they give credit. And on AWS, they have like a sort of semi-free plan for a year. So you can definitely use that. The, um, the problems uh, though I was uh, showing with local host, uh, local stack is basically what if you want to kind of try to build Terraform for enterprise grade uh, solution. For example, like large EKS cluster with a lot of nodes where $300 would expire, like, I don't know, in less than a day. So that uh, in that case, local stack really provides you a great optionality to do that. I mean, to create the stack without uh, actually going, uh, I, I mean, let's say you want to create the EKS uh, cluster on AWS with I don't know, 10, 20, whatever nodes. So in local stack, you can actually do that with, with no cost and you can test those scripts and, and stuff like that. Uh, so I yeah. I included, uh, I just put the link in the chat yeah. for the link awesome. for the AWS uh, awesome. proof of concept program. So. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Oh, I, I, I saw some somebody else did as well. Okay, that's cool. So for Minikube, yeah, that's, that's a great tool. So the one I was showing is uh, actually analog which on our side we use uh, more uh, which is called k3s uh, again I, I don't know uh, if you're familiar or not but uh, basically one of the things i was uh, just showing this k3d tool it allows you to spin those k3s clusters very quickly and you can have actually several of them at the same time uh, I, I don't know i hope the the stream worked at that time but essentially you just do k3d create cluster a create cluster b and you can have multiple clusters running on at the same time and uh, again if you have a sufficiently uh, powerful machine then uh, yeah you can run all of them you can try multi-cluster configuration and uh, yeah that, that that's very fast so uh, you can do it with Minikube for sure, but you can do it with K3S as well. K3S in I my think, experience. I think K3S is the better tool for engineering, but if you're just starting out, I feel like Minikube is more user-friendly. Um, that would be my opinion. I feel like if you're trying yeah. to go for what they're going to use in a professional environment, it's definitely going to be K3S 100%. Yeah. So I, I think uh, the good 
part about K3S is uh, the uh, ease of installation improved significantly uh, over time, and generally, like over uh, I don't know, since 2016, or it's it's much much easier. It, it to used create, to be rough. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. used to be pretty rough yeah, to create a Kubernetes cluster. Yeah. Um, and thank you, Rusty. Just uh, see in chat. So Rusty posted the script that you can actually create uh, several uh, uh, virtual, uh, like vagrant virtual machines in the same script, which is yeah, which is a great point actually. So you don't necessarily have to do it in, in different directories. You can just run uh, one uh, one big script, and it will cre create you all all these big machines. And uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, what you can try, so one kind of good example is there is this Kubernetes hard, the hard way um, writing by Kelsey Hightower, I believe. You can search for that and it shows you to do like Kubernetes hard way and you can use uh, the similar um, approach on Vagrant to create like three VMs. And uh, it shows how to provide, like this write-up shows how to provision all the certificates, all the networking, everything you need, uh, how to run it. So that that's very cool. Uh, yeah, and we have uh, links below by Linux guy and by Tatal about, uh, you can stay on the stage, but <laughs> no problem. Uh, regarding how to get those uh, AWS initial credits, which which is nice. Um, do we have uh, like are there any more questions or anything? You can type in the chat if there is something, or if you'd like to describe some more tooling that you're usually using, that that will be appreciated as well. I'll just wait for. For a bit. Okay. Um, so good. No questions. So I hope uh, everything everything was uh, more or less uh, clear uh, there. So I'll I'll add one more thing regarding Azure. So on Azure, uh, they provide uh, like training labs, which you don't have to pay for. And essentially, you get uh, environments during for uh, like while you're going through this training labs, you're getting temporary environments on Azure where you can try things and do things. So if you're working with Azure, you can actually use that for for learning, again without uh, like paying or anything. Uh, it's for sure. It's very cool if your organization gives uh, some opportunity and like has some substantial cloud budget when you can do it all on uh, organizational budget. But uh, again, the cool part is uh, with uh, AWS with Azure, you can do a lot of those things uh, just uh, just by going with the with their training program. Okay, so cool. If there are no more questions here that then uh, that's it I think we'll be uh, wrapping up uh, here I just so one more question from me if you uh, like not necessary right now but uh, if you can think about it uh, if you have ideas for next event so I kind of want to do this uh, uh, calls monthly and if you have ideas uh, what could it be and potentially if you have some ideas what you want to present there that would be very much appreciated. So either you can bring it up now or you can message me later at any point and we can discuss. Uh, also, while not everybody left, I know Rusty is from Ottawa. Are there any more, any other people from Ottawa in the chat? If you could just say plus or I don't know, or raise hand or something. Cool. Uh, that that's just a separate subject. Is uh, we'd like to have uh, personal meetups. Uh, thanks, Mikhaila. Uh, so two people, and I know there are a few more people that are interested. So we'd like to do in-person gatherings in Ottawa at some point, uh, probably towards fall. So if we'll have uh, like more people participating in this kind of meeting, so we can organize and coordinate. 
probably they um, were aiming like smaller events first and then hopefully we can get a larger audience here so that that's a separate subject that uh, that we want to try uh, okay uh, with that uh, thank you everyone for joining if you uh, again if you have uh, ideas or would like to present something for the next time let me know if not uh, I'll, I'll also think something and we'll definitely figure out something for the next month. Uh, there will also be a recording of this uh, meetup, so you can watch it later. And I'll try, if there was this issue with the um, presentation, I'll try to fix it. I think it will be fine in recording, actually, because I was recording off my screen and it was showing correctly there. But I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just put the, the slides in if they were not showing at some point. So again, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, enjoy the uh, rest of the day, depending on what, what's the time for you, and uh, thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks, Paul. Bye. Thank you.